Welcome back to the Make It Happen podcast. I'm your host, Melanie Moreno. Coincidentally, today's guest is of the same name. Well, the same first name. Which, can I just say, she has a way fancier pronunciation of. She says it in the episode, but besides that, I do relate to Melanie's story and her words so much. I knew we would have things in common, both coming from the health and wellness space, but I didn't realize how much we would actually have in common until about halfway through recording. Let me give some background here. So I hit up Melanie LeBlanc Sturgeon to be a guest on this podcast after witnessing her come to what appeared to be a place of happiness and contentment after having recognized her eating disordered ways. She explains in the episode what it was like having an eating disorder take up the majority of her life, what contributed to it, and how life really is so much more joyful beyond the eating disorder. With that being said, it's worth noting that if this sort of content is triggering for you, you might want to abstain from listening, but I think Melanie addresses this in a really safe way, especially because this is the kind of content she talks about on her Instagram, and she has already fine-tuned the way that she conveys this information so that it can be more constructive and helpful for her audience and listeners instead of destructive, which might come from someone who is currently in disordered eating patterns. I think it's really important to address what's been going on with me in relation to the subject. I was truly just curious to hear Melanie's story, but it wasn't until we got to talking and hearing how her interest in health, type A tendencies, and more contributed to restrictive patterns that I could see myself in her shoes. For a long time, I've identified as a healthy person, air quotes around healthy person, and having major interests in all things health, I found ways to just dive deeper into that realm, all while denying the very real ways that this interest was limiting my life. At a point in the episode, Melanie says how health is important, but nowhere is it said that we have to be healthy. I'm probably butchering that, but basically it blew my mind to think, what if I didn't have to care so much about my health? The past several years of my life have been about finding control in my dietary choices when I felt like I had no control anywhere else in my life. I thought studying nutrition and trying to promote healthy ways of eating were me helping others, and maybe it did somewhat, but it did not feel healthy for me because all the while I kept going further and further down this narrow hole until I just felt choked. It's hard to realize you're living in such a box until someone else comes and says, when you let go of some control, the world opens up for you. I'm not sure how comfortable I feel talking about my own disordered eating ways myself, because one, I've never had any sort of doctor-diagnosed eating disorder, but the symptoms are plenty there, or they were there. And two, I don't want to label myself that way. I'm not the girl in recovery, even though I am. That's just not a label I want put on me. I feel like sometimes we can use labels as things to hide behind. I could go into a whole spiel about this, but while a label is a way to express preferences or needs, and I mean no disrespect for people who do use a label of any kind, but just for me, I realize the moment I apply a label, I feel obligated to represent myself that way, or talk about topics pertaining to the label. Maybe I'll talk about my experiences here and there, because it is an important thing to shine a light on, but it isn't all of me. I've only recently realized that there is so much more to me than what I've let myself see. I really do have my guest today to thank for that. It was an unexpected but monumental moment for me. Her simply sharing her story helped me shift the ways that I see myself and how I want to be better for myself. If this topic doesn't sound like your cup of tea or you don't think any of this is relevant to you, I would still encourage you to keep listening. We get into a really cool discussion about the diet culture, especially the ways that it transgresses through our modern, or at least Western, society in numerous ways. We highlight some taboo topics about language and the ways that it can contribute to eating disorders, fat phobia, and simply oppression. It's the kind of shameful language that knows no bounds of race, status, or sexual orientation. And so we talk about the ways to reframe it for the betterment of all, 
not just those in eating disorder recovery. So this episode is a really good one. These days, Melanie now chases joy and advocates for a bigger, fuller life, inspiring many. So it was truly my pleasure that we were able to sit down to have this conversation. Without further ado, here is Melanie LeBlanc Sturgeon. First, let me say thank you very much for coming on the Make It Happen podcast. Well, thank you so much for reaching out. I'm really excited to chat with you today. First, I'm really curious. Do you pronounce your name? I noticed that there's an accent mark on your name. How do you pronounce it? Well, I am from a bilingual French-English community, and I was actually uh, brought up French. So um, my w- when I'm speaking French, I pronounce it Mélanie. And when I'm with English people, I, you know, just to make it easier for everyone, we just say Melanie. But, um, but I do have some friends that kind of like the Beyonce thing, say, you know, say it the real way. Um, so I, I, I would say Melanie, but it is Melanie. So. <laughs> oh, wow. I've always been curious about that. I like the way it sounds. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Let me actually have you dive into your upbringing a little bit, introduce yourself and tell us what growing up was like for you, what was uh, your younger self like, all that good stuff. Sure. So, well, I guess I'll start by presenting myself. My name is Melanie and I am, uh, I'm from Eastern Canada and I grew up here, like I said, in a French English community and I was brought up in French. And I grew up as an only child with a single mom. And I did see my dad, but kind of with, I saw my dad less often than my mom. So um, me and my mom were very, very close for the majority of my childhood. But like any, <laughs> any teenager, times can be tough with moms, especially where uh, my mom had me a little bit later in life. She was 39 when she had me. So when I was hitting puberty, she was going through menopause. So we had a lot of hormones going through the house and we both have big personalities and strong uh, opinions. So we did have some rough times, but um, that's just part of growing up, I guess. So growing up here, I I had um, a lot of friends. I was always very social and outgoing. I, I had a lot of fun with my friends, but I did have, I had a really hard time with my body image and my weight as of probably eight years old um, is my first memory of really thinking about my body in a negative way. So it, it was rough because um, when I look at pictures now of myself as a kid, I, I don't see a bigger kid. But when I was a kid, I really saw myself as much bigger. And I, I made the active efforts as young as, you know, eight, 10, 12 years old to try to shrink my body. So it, it was a long stretch of time where I really actively tried to stretch the two sorry to shrink my body so it was it really it took a big toll on me and it was a big part of um, who the, the way that I saw the world and saw myself I went to, to university I studied languages and literature and uh, my journey with body image continued there in different forms and then um, after you know growing up and having some jobs and being in the world uh, eventually you know after really hitting rock bottom kind of realizing that life was about more than my body I decided to recover from um, my eating disorder and my bad body image so I've been on that journey for a little over a year now and um, it feels like a short time it also feels like a long time in a way but it really opened my eyes to see the world in a totally different way Uh, My life has completely changed for the better. And I guess, I guess that's a little bit about me. Wow, that's, you kind of summed up your, not your life story, but uh, you gave us a nice summary there. So (laughs) how would you say that the disordered eating sort of thoughts and maybe tendencies started? Did you kind of grow up with like your parents telling you things or would you say peer pressure or media? What sort of things influence that? Well, it's really hard to narrow it down to exactly maybe a moment or a comment or a specific thing, because there are so many elements to, you know, the way that we see our bodies, especially as people socialize as women. 
um, or brought up as women, we, you know, there's just constant pressures. Um, but it was definitely, especially at a very young age, a lot of the way that I tried to change my body was done in complete secret. So it was hard to, I didn't get any specific comments about, you know, you should be smaller or anything like that. But there were definitely those messages in very subtle ways, like, um, you know, I would have a different portion on my plate that uh, another person would when somebody would serve me or, um, you know, I was told that I needed to exercise more for my health, but my friends weren't told didn't have that same message when they were in smaller bodies. So it definitely was like a culmination of multiple things and multiple little comments and little moments, microaggressions that really led up to me thinking, okay, my body and my body size equals my worth. And um, that was also really, I, I was, my mom was an esthetician. So I grew up in that very like, you know, you need to, you know, always look your best kind of environment. So that definitely played a big role in there. But I, I really think that it was just multiple comments because maybe I wasn't a little bit of a larger body than my friends growing up that made me feel like I had to change something um, in order to be happier and in order to fit in. And where did that lead you? Well, it led me to really dark places. I started engaging in a lot of restriction in order to to be smaller. Um, I remember, you know, seeing those commercials for diet pills on TV and seeing that, you know, you had to be 18 or older to buy them and thinking, oh, I just want to be able to buy them. It seems so easy. You just take a pill and you get smaller. Because even at that age, I had already tried so many diets, you know, uh, by 14 years old that I already knew how, you know, we now know that, you know, diets just don't work. Um, and that a very, very small percentage of the population are able to keep the weight off. And when they do keep that weight off, they usually uh, have a lot of really unhealthy or unhealthful eating patterns. So even then, I already knew that it was hard. It was going to be hard. And I struggled and I yo-yo dieted and I went from one diet to the other. And some were quite radical and dangerous. And um, I really missed out on a lot of experiences because of the way that I saw my body and because of the restrictions that I put onto my life. You know, I wasn't necessarily always 100% present when I was at a friend's birthday party because I thought, okay, I can't have that cake. Or my body was so ravenous for food that I would eat so much cake and I would feel so observed. So these were all experiences that I, I missed out on and that I really I put myself in a very small box in order to what I thought would bring me so much happiness, but it, it really took away um, a lot of my happiness and it really stole a lot of my time. Um, so it led me to that. And then eventually when I was about 18, I lost a lot of weight. So the, I remember it was like New Year's Eve, grade 12. And I said, screw this. I can't do this anymore. I can't go to university, you know, with this body. I just can't. Because at that point, I really believed that my body was my social capital. So um, I decided to, you know, do whatever it took. And so my, you know, I, re I restricted quite a bit. I was at the gym at least once a day for two hours. And if not two times a day for two hours. And uh, I was constantly passing out. I have low blood sugar all the time. I have to eat constantly, but I didn't understand my body very well at that age. So I, you know, I, I was really, I was in a, a state of starvation. And unfortunately, and yet fortunately, at the time, it, it worked. I was, I was losing weight quite rapidly. So I, I lost a significant amount of weight in about a year. And then I, when I went to school in university, I really wanted to maintain that weight loss because I was getting so much positive reinforcement for saying, oh my gosh, you look so good. What are you doing? What's your secret? I had, you know, boys that used to bully me in high school that, you know, came up to me and said, wow, you look so much better. So I had these, these reinforcements that were thrown at me that pushed me to try to maintain that weight. So that means that I, I started eating a little bit more because I knew that I had lost the amount of weight that I had told myself I needed to lose. But I, in order to maintain that, my restrictions 
stayed in my life in terms of food and in terms of, you know, imposing a lot of, a lot of exercise. Um, but it kind of shifted from like a place of like, you know, I, I wasn't able to be diagnosed uh, then because I wasn't seeing anyone, but from, you know, all points that, you know, where me and my current therapist are able to see, like I was anorexic at that point um with a touch of orthorexia but then it really shifted to like a classic case of orthorexia where I became obsessed with maintaining that weight loss obsessed with having optimal health obsessed with you know not allowing anything that does not promote health in my life so that became really draining and time consuming and it really limited me in my life experiences and even you know um it really it impeded on my studies. My grades weren't that great. My relationships were really, really bad. Um, so that really took over my life at that point. I kind of know, in, in some ways, I kind of know what that orthorexia mindset feels like. And it's really troubling. I can imagine being in in school and being with so many people and kind of feeling good about yourself or the way you look but you're probably still consumed by those thoughts, right? Like just thinking about your next meal or how to, you know, not overdo it on calories or something, right? Exactly. It's kind of like, okay, this is working. This for once is working. So how can I make sure that I don't screw it up? And that becomes a full-time job. Like, because you really believe when you're in that mindset, you really believe that you have complete control over your body. But the truth is we don't, we don't have complete control over our bodies. And even by, you know, adopting the, the, the healthiest quote unquote lifestyle, we still don't have complete control. But when you're in that orthorexia mindset, you want that control. It really is about control. It can really take so much valuable, precious time away from your life. When you really do believe that you're doing the right thing, when I, you know, now am able to really see orthorexia and different eating disorders or just disordered eating around me, you know, when you see it, you can't unsee it anymore. And in the beginning of my recovery, I used to feel completely defensive and like upset when I would see it because I thought, oh, like, seriously, are they really doing that to themselves? But now with, you know, time recovery and processing things, I can just feel I feel just so bad and I just feel so much compassion and I can really see like oh like if if you only knew which you might one day I hope your life can be so much more full just by letting go of a little bit of control or a lot in some cases but no it's it's definitely can be all consuming arthorexia is unfortunately right now not in the DSM-5 so it's not a diagnosable eating disorder but it is a very real and very serious eating disorder that in some cases can be completely undetectable to many people because it really is portrayed as the ideal version of living your life but um, in reality it is really really serious. Okay so you kind of mentioned that you jumped around from different diets and were really trying to obtain that optimal health for yourself Mm -hmm. was that around the time how how cycle syncing fit into your life which I actually think that's probably how I found you how I came across you yes I think so yeah I was into that for a while as well well I mean in some ways I'm still into it but different yeah yeah exactly I totally relate to that it's still a big part of my life, but totally different because so basically the the period that I was just discussing was like, while I was in university, like maybe, well, you know what, I'm going to say the ter- the two first years of university. Then I, I found kind of a way to maintain my weight loss uh, in a way that I thought was totally safe and totally healthy and totally fine. And this is kind of like a controversial topic, but i I decided to go vegan. And so I, I was vegan for four years. And in in many ways, it was really great. And in the most important way, it was a very easy way for me to continue my eating disorder without anybody noticing. Uh, because, you know, when you're eating only plant-based, it can be very easy not to eat enough. 
and to look like you are eating enough. So I, I believe that people can be vegan and be very, very healthy and satisfied, but I was still sick. So I couldn't be, I couldn't have any food restrictions, but I had multiple food restrictions. So through veganism, it really led me to like the whole world of, you know, holistic healing and natural remedies and things like that. And I really became completely obsessed and I loved it. Like it really became my life. And I even uh, signed up for a natural nutrition course after university to become a holistic uh, registered nutritionist. And in, in many ways that that part of my life was I was very excited because I found this thing that I could just fully immerse myself in and really, really be good at. And, you know, the thing about people with eating disorders is that we are most, most of us are all very type A, perfectionist. We are people pleasers. We want to do everything the right way. And so I realized like, oh my gosh, I can be so good at this. I can really do it a hundred percent. I, I'm not going to screw up. I'm going to be like as healthy as I can. And it was, it, it really brought a lot of, you know, cool connections with people on Instagram and things like that. But it also brought me the most severe portion of my orthorexia because that's when I discovered cycle thinking. So I had been on the IUD for about five years. I was on the Mirena and then Actually, I said, let's probably preface this for those who don't know what cycle syncing is. Would you oh, care to kind of, yeah, maybe some people aren't aware. So for would sure. you care to describe that also? Of course. So cycle syncing is, cycle syncing is when, you know, you sync up your life to your menstrual cycle. Everybody does it differently, but the, the, the traditional, I guess, uh, way to do it would be to sync up you eat certain foods during certain parts of your cycle for you to have optimal, you know, energy and to better serve you during that period of your cycle. So whether it's food or exercise or how you interact with others or the way that you plan your schedule. So cycle thinking is making sure that you don't go against your cycle and that you flow with it and that you really are using your cycle to your advantage instead of always fighting it and being frustrated that you have no energy during a certain phase of your cycle um, because you, you know, you actually don't have that much energy during that phase of your cycle and that you scheduled so many different things for yourself that week. Um, instead of doing that, then you work with it. Um, but that can become tricky because when you are coming from a really like controlling mindset, it's a very easy way to get overly controlling with yourself, but it can also bring you um, a much easier and natural um, way to, you know, live your life also. So it just depends on whose hands, in whose hands is, is going about with it, really. Excellent. As you were saying. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, cycle so, thinking. I found cycle thinking because I was really, really struggling with my hormones after I got my IUD removed. So I had been on some form of birth control since I was 15. So um, at that point, I was 22 or three when I got my IUD removed. So it had been a while. And um, I in no way expected the way my body would feel um, after I got it removed, because I honestly didn't do any research and just thought, okay, I'm not in a heterosexual relationship right now. Uh, I don't think that I need birth control, so I'm going to get it removed. So I did. And when I did, um, about a month after I got it removed, I guess when my next cycle would have been, um, I started feeling really, really weird. So m the beginning, it was mostly like super low energy, super lethargic, very sad. I had never gone through depression, but it was almost, I mean, I don't, I, if, I have no idea what depression is like, but I feel like it was similar to that. I'm, I'm very outgoing and very social and I wanted nothing to do with social interactions. I was just kind of stuck in this rut and it felt awful. And then there were other things that started popping up like a lot of acne that I hadn't had in a very long time, facial hair growth, um, a little bit of weight gain, which freaked me out because I was still quite in that, you know, diet culture mindset. 
um, I just, I, I felt like I was losing control of my body. And it was hard because I also had a lot of mood swings and my relationships were kind of suffering. And I thought, I need to take control of this. I really do. And I knew I was able to because I am very good at taking control of things. So that's when I started doing research on, you know, post birth control syndrome and uh, how I could have better hormones, uh, better performing hormones, I guess. So I uh, landed on cycle thinking. And so I really went full force in, you know, doing the meal plans and doing the cleanses and optimizing my workout schedule. And even my work revolved around that. Um, And I did that for a little over a year. And through that, I started an Instagram because I really wanted to connect with other people who had, you know, unbalanced hormones and I wanted to share what I had learned and I wanted to try to, you know, not feel so alone. Um, And that work definitely connected with a lot of people and it felt good to not feel so alone. But I also definitely shared a lot of disordered stuff that I sometimes regret because uh, I know that a lot of that might have led people down a dark path, but um, I did not know any better at that point. And I, I tried my best to show myself a lot of grace when it comes to that. But I definitely went full force into cycle thinking. And I'm honestly very grateful that I did because at some point, it was right after my wedding, I got married in June of 2018 and right the day after my wedding, uh, my wife and I hopped on a plane and went to Italy and we went to Italy for a little over two weeks and I crashed. I crashed hard because anybody that has gone through a wedding knows that it's, um, it's hard on the body and on the, on the spirit. But um, I also crashed because I emotionally was so, I couldn't, believe that I was in Italy on my dream honeymoon and I couldn't eat what was in front of me I had set so many rules for myself and I even the things that you know were vegan because I was vegan at that point they didn't fit in my cycle thinking um, menu and you know when you're in a foreign country you you know you do you you have to kind of go with the flow and I I my mind would just couldn't I had to control every second of that trip and I had to, you know, find some type of fruit place or, you know, I needed to find the things that I could eat. And it really, honestly, really hindered that, that trip, um, which is really, really sad because I can never get that again. When I came home, I realized, wow, I can't believe that just happened. I can't believe that my eating restrictions really limited our trip wasn't me it wasn't just me that was on that trip it was my wife too and because of my choices we missed out on so so much so that's when I realized there's something wrong here I need to stop I need to evaluate what's going on around me and decide what can I do to improve this and that's when I very slowly but surely dipped my big toe into the big pool of recovery um, and realized what orthorexia was and that I was very much orthorexic and it was scary and there was a lot of emotions going on but it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me honestly. I want to let you in on what my supplement routine looks like right now. So, the first thing in the morning, I like to make a hot drink. Sometimes it's lemon water, but I also love my yogi teas. I'll prep that and grab a pack of my care of supplements. Previously, I used to dig around my kitchen cabinets looking for each of my individual vitamin bottles, opening each one, gathering a little pile, possibly forgetting a vitamin. It was just such a chore. Now I can get all of the supplements I like to take conveniently in one little package. Care of makes high quality vitamins, minerals, adaptogenic herbs, probiotics, and other supplements. And all you need to do is subscribe to what you want. When you go to takecareof.com, you can create your profile, take a short quiz to assess your supplement needs, and they'll take care of the rest. It's a fully customizable subscription service that will have your supplements delivered right to your door, No more shuffling around your cabinet looking for pill bottles 
or having to worry about running to the store to repurchase. I love that I can just grab my Care of packet and everything I need is in there. Care of takes care of you. To try Care of, head to takecareof.com or visit the link in the show notes to get $40 off of your first order. That's takecareof.com. With the rise of non-toxic products in the beauty and skincare industry, it's hard to find what's worth trying. There's one brand that I've been using for over a year now that I have got to tell you guys about. That is Frey Skincare. Their company started with the launch of a specially formulated sunscreen for active lifestyles that won't leave you greasy or break you out. But they've since expanded to a wide range of products from tinted moisturizers to facial cleansers and oils, a line of body products, and most notably their Frey 123 set, which is the perfect place to start if you're new to their products. I'd also recommend picking up their Detox Me face mask. It has cleansing microbeads made from jojoba oil that are perfect for a light exfoliation without stripping your skin. It also leaves my face feeling so fresh and supple after using it. I love it. Frey's team of dermatological scientists have formulated each product with the rejuvenating benefits of argan oil to hydrate, protect, and exfoliate your skin and leave you glowing or your money back. Plus, as part of their give back mission for every skincare set that they sell, they plant an argan tree to help replenish the endangered argan forest in Morocco and support the women who harvest the argan oil. To get the glowy skin you've been seeking and a risk-free trial of their famous Frey 123 set, head to freyskincare.com slash melaniem and use the code melaniem at checkout for a wicked discount. That's freyskincare.com slash melaniem. So you mentioned that this honeymoon trip wasn't it wasn't just going to affect you if you decided not to eat certain things. You're there with your wife. You're trying to celebrate and have a good time. So how has that been, you know, being in being in a relationship? And did she see what you were going through? And what sort of things would she say to you? Or how, how were those interactions? Mm. Well, that's a really interesting thing. Once again, about orthorexia is that it, it can really be undetectable, especially with like all of the health trends that we have going on right now, which is very normalized. So me and my wife talk about this quite often, about how neither of us knew that I had an eating disorder. Um, Because, you know, in our relationship, I'm a little bit more dominant, and she's a little bit more passive. And, you know, she's, she's very easygoing. And if I say, I want a meal plan that is for my luteal phase this week, she's just going to go with the flow and be fine with it. So I know now through our discussions that, you know, she thought it was a bit much, but she is so easygoing and knows that I'm intense. So she just kind of allowed it and was like, oh, whatever makes her happy. So it was really, she she didn't really know. But when we were on that trip, that's when we both kind of like realized because I was out of, I was no longer in an environment where that I could control things, you know, like we, we were on our own. We didn't know what was going on. We were trying our best to just, you know, figure out where to take the train. So um, it really highlighted the fact that I needed to control everything, especially my food intake, or I guess our food intake, because we were both on the same, you know, we were both vegan at the time. And so it was, um, it was really, really tough on us because I was not well. I was not happy. I was always kind of like striving for perfection and it was really hindering us. But through recovery, we have discovered that, you know, just the other day she told me like, I had no idea you were so funny. (laughs) You know, we've been together for over six years and we're just getting to know each other 100% all over again now because I'm a different person when I'm in recovery than I was when we met. And she's a different partner to me now because I used to be the caretaker and all of a sudden she's the one that's taking care of me. So it's completely changed things. And it was, it was rough on us for a long time, but recovery has literally changed the dynamic of our relationship for the best. Wow. That's incredible. Um, I mean, that ties into what you said earlier about just relinquishing a little bit of control and then that that starts to shift everything. It totally does. Like letting go of control when that is a big part of who you are being controlling is much easier said than done. But when you actually allow it to happen, 
you get to know yourself in a totally different way and you allow other people around you to shine and to take care of you. And I think that that is really important in life to allow others to take care of you. Can you elaborate on that? What do you, what do you mean by so, that? Well, like I said, um, a lot of people with eating disorders are, are type A, they're controlling or well, controlling might sound like a bad term, which is kind of is, but you know, perfectionist type. Um, and, and often those types of people, they, they're always the ones taking care of others or trying to please others. And sometimes that can be a bad thing because who's taking care of you at the end of the day, you know, like it's so much emotional labor to always be the caretaker in all of your relationships. It is not healthy either. You become eventually a little bit resentful because you realize, oh my gosh, I need that too. And um, in my experience, my recovery has, Put me in a really vulnerable place where I have to admit, okay, there's something wrong and I need to take some time to put on myself in order to heal. But it also made me admit that I cannot do this alone. I share a life with my wife and I need her support. There are some people in my life that aren't able to give me that support, unfortunately, and that's okay. They're in their own place. They're, they're living their own struggles. But to have your life partner there and um, willing to learn and to change their approach and to say, okay, my traditional role in this relationship was not the caretaker, but I'm going to take that on because my partner needs it is in a huge, huge part of healing um, my, my wife, I go to a, uh, eating disorder support group two two once every two weeks, sorry. And, um, the support group that the, the psychologist that leads it, she decided to start a support group for friends and family, um, and loved ones of people with eating disorders. And she started going in October. And I remember the Monday that she was going to go, I woke up that morning and I felt I don't know what it was. I felt completely invincible that day because when you have an eating disorder, sometimes you, you, real, you understand that the eating disorder is not you. The eating disorder is a completely other thing living inside of you. Some people call him Ed or her or whatever, but you know, I know that Ed is not me. He's a whole other person inside of me. And sometimes he takes over, you know, and you, he, he makes you a little bit controlling and it makes you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, struggle a little bit more. But that day he had no power over me because I knew that that night my wife was going to sit there and learn and be supported by other people. Um, and she was going to put aside two hours a week for eight weeks straight in order to help me heal. And it made me realize in that moment how important it is to allow yourself to be helped because it really takes the power away from what's bothering you and what's hurting you. So it really is powerful. So what would be a sort of that moment where you decided, was it when you came back from your honeymoon, was that when you decided like, I'm just going to stop being vegan? I want to get out of this eating disorder mindset. Well, it took a little while to it, it was very it, it was very step by step so when I came back I realized okay there's something wrong I have no idea what it is but I know that I'm not happy and I don't feel well um and then when it's almost like that opened the door for me to be really more intuitive with the way that I felt because a few I don't know exactly the timeline but I feel like maybe a few days after that my body started giving me signs like I started having these signs where I needed to rest more. And that was weird for me because I was raised in a household where it was like, okay, you'll rest later. You have too much stuff to do. You can't rest. So um, I, I, I started allowing myself to rest and that was a little bit weird and uncomfortable. And then my body started showing me signs of like, I think I want meat. And that was extremely difficult for me because I was very into the whole ethical side of veganism and you know animal rights and environmentalism and all of that and I still see a lot of, of validity in that but I, I 
I had to cope with the fact that my body was telling me that I, I was craving something. And I, I really, it took me a very long time. I'd say probably, you know, from July to November of last year to really accept, okay, I'm allowed to eat this. I am not in a place where I can restrict any foods right now. All foods need to fit in my life in order for me to heal. So uh, I, I very slowly but surely started reintroducing foods into my diet and really feeling the benefits from just allowing myself to eat everything and anything. Um, it was extremely liberating. It was scary. Don't get me wrong. There were days where I was so scared and I cried so much just about one meal. Uh, because my whole identity was, you know, was resting in this, this label of vegan and also, you know, like healthy person um, who was very public about, you know, I was very public about the way that I live my life. It was almost like I had to just become a whole new person in a short amount of time, um, just in order to heal. Um, it, it was, it was tough, but as I started, as I allowed myself more and more things, my life just improved. Every every day, every week, every month, I started laughing more. I started having more fun. I started learning more about myself. Even on the bad days, there was more good than on the good days where I was sick. So it really showed me that in order to be my best self right now, I cannot live a life of restriction. I need to allow all foods and, and I need to be okay with, with what that means for my life and what that means for my identity as a person. Um, and it's been extremely rewarding to just allow myself to have what I want when I want it and how much I want. And th that's really beautiful to hear how you can just kind of, kind of slowly over time, relinquish a little bit of control and add things into your life instead of depriving, which is kind of what your entire, you know, for a large portion of your life, it was depriving, depriving of foods, depriving of maybe um, social engagement, fun, joy. Um, so that sounds beautiful to just kind of allow in some other stuff. And if your identity was tied into being a healthy person, do you feel you can still have goals for yourself, like personal improvement sort of goals, whether that be for your personal health or fitness or weight? Do you feel like those fit in or do you just completely wipe all that off the table? Well, I definitely still have goals for myself, but they are completely different because my the way that I see my worth has changed. So where before my goals were completely... Well, not completely. I did, I did still have, you know, a whole, that's one of the coolest things that I always think about people with, you know, mental health struggles is like outside of their mental health struggle, they have a whole entire life going on. And I think that that's so, 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 it just demonstrates human resilience and how amazing we are. But outside of it, outside of my disorder, I had, you know, um, career goals and, you know, relationship goals and all of these things. And they were still happening because, because I, I, I really, so focused and really performed well but now I really can see that my worth no longer lies in my body and no longer lies in my appearance and even no longer lies in my health because you know as humans we are not you know morally required to be perfectly healthy that has nothing to do with our with our worth and I was convinced of that and now you know, I, although I believe health is important in order to live a very happy life, it is not the most important thing. So I am able to broaden my goals to like way more things because I've gained so, so much time to do things that I love. So um, for an example, my Instagram that I was using in order to really document and promote maybe a disordered life. Um, I'm now able to use to talk about recovery and healing and body image issues. And it has really sparked a fire in me because I believe that there is, there is so much there to cover. And so now, like, instead of having a goal to promote, you know, healthism, my goal is now to promote actual happiness and health and living a bigger, fuller life through 
really living free of restriction. And, you know, I also am able to set goals like traveling and things like that, because now my money isn't going all on, you know, a lot of, a lot of supplements and a lot of things that I was really, really pushing onto myself because I really believe that that's what, what would save me at the end of the day, which, and don't get me wrong, I do still take some vitamins and things like that. I think that some of them are very important, but when it really takes like a third of your income to, you know, to, to sustain your, your controlling nature, um, that's very limiting in your goals. So now I'm able to say, okay, instead of that, I'm going to travel or now I've discovered so many cool things about myself. Like, you know, I love to knit. So now I'm knitting blankets and I'm having so much more fun in life. So my goals have shifted from, you know, being this ideal small body person who promotes healthy, you know, quote unquote, healthy behaviors to like just a person who really feels fully satisfied and happy and really, really joyful like that's my goal now is just to really experience life without restriction that feels so heartwarming to hear I really (laughs) like that like you've added in so many like new hobbies and I can hear it in your voice it sounds like you have a newfound vibrancy in in your life totally it really having more time to actually do the things that you love is so cool like it's so cool to really be able to reinvest your time which is our most important resource in life so no I definitely that's definitely the best and coolest side effect of letting go of diet culture for sure you've also been pretty clear on how in this time of recovery you want to keep certain things out just to not be triggering right so what sort of, what's the language around like describing bodies or talking about um, our bodies? What sort of language would you say is, you know, I think there's a lot of subtle ways that people talk about our bodies on a daily basis, you know, just casually even, they might not know it, but there's a lot of um, language that kind of starts to instill those messages. Like you said, growing up, you're just hearing um, little little bits and pieces and then you turn that into something. What do you think is language that we need to be more cautious of? That's a really important topic because I think that whether we are really, really like obviously struggling with our body image or not, we are all impacted by certain language, certain words, certain terms, or just even conversations that surround bodies. And the the biggest one I I feel is talking about specific numbers um, in when it comes to either the amount of calories that we're eating or not eating or our our weight or, or even the size of our pants. I think that you know we all know we've we all know that uh, that picture that was floating around Facebook a few years ago of like what a size eight looks like in 10 different brands all bodies are different and we cannot always if I say I am this size and you see me as your perfect you know ideal body we are not the same and that can perpetuate like a very unhealthy like oh my gosh I need to change my body in order to be her size or um, I need to eat that amount of calorie because she eats that amount of calories a day it can be very very difficult to hear that kind of language um, and very triggering in different ways. And like I said, not even just for people with eating disorders, but for people who are just um, living in diet culture and it can be very difficult. The other thing is, and this is harder to unlearn, I find, is just the language about, usually it will, it will float around, you know, fashion style uh, when we hear something you should really buy that because it's really flattering on you. What does that mean? It usually means it makes you look smaller. Like, you know, we all know the classic rule of you're not allowed to wear horizontal stripes if you're bigger than, I don't know, a certain size. Um, But if you wear vertical stripes, that's flattering on you. So I think that that can be really hard to hear, especially if someone knows that you're trying to heal your body image 
that can be something that you can, you know, set a boundary on and say, you know what, I love this and I want to wear it. And it's not about how it makes me look. It's not about if it makes me look smaller. I'm really, you know, I love this piece or, you know, I want to wear horizontal stripes regardless of what you think. <laughs> so um, I think that small things like that can be difficult to hear when you're really trying to live free of diet culture. Uh, other things that I find that we, that would be really helpful for all of us to stay away from is commenting on other people's food. Holy Healed on Instagram, who I love and everybody should go follow, uh, made this shirt last year that said, my plate, my business. And I think that that is such an important message because commenting on what someone else is eating is never appropriate. Just like commenting on anyone's body, whether it's a compliment or not, I believe is not really warranted unless the person has told you that you can comment on their body um making you know i i remember being in high school and people making comments about what i was eating um in the cafeteria and that really really played a big role in the way that i saw myself and how body, how food could impact my body in a negative way so i think that it's very important to not comment on someone's portion size or food choices anything like that is none of your business uh, we're all allowed and able to make our own food choices without anybody's approval but uh those things are like i they're really really hard to not partake in because especially as as people socialize as women we really have been taught that these are things that we bond over you know, we bond over our diets, we bond over our weight loss, we bond over our weight gain. Even, you know, with complete strangers, we're able to connect on those things in, you know, a washroom somewhere. So it, it's tough because that's how we were socialized. But I think that by setting some, some boundaries here and there with the people that we, the people in our lives, we can make a, a difference in changing that narrative and changing what we bond on and what we what we connect on because it doesn't have to be about our bodies there's so many other things that are going on in our lives other than what's going on with our bodies so there's definitely a lot of things that we can do to improve the culture and to try to eradicate the diet the, the, the diet culture around us you made a remark right now about how we I think you're speaking specifically about women when you say that we bond over diets and weight and fashion. These are all very superficial things. And just hearing you say that, it struck me like, wow, that's true. And I don't think, I mean, I actually, I, I mean, I know whenever I've interacted, if I'm in a group of guys, um, in, in a group with guys, they don't talk about their diet or they don't talk about their weight or um like what clothes looks good on them or how they yeah they don't talk exactly. about these things or exercise it's wild um it is it oh really gosh. is wild and you know I heard I don't know who said this I was listening to a podcast maybe last year and and this might sound radical to a lot of people but it made a lot of sense to me but I the, the person said that diet culture is one of the most effective tools of the patriarchy. It is what keeps us small. It what It's what keeps us talking about uh, not very important things. It's basically what is keeping us from taking over the world right now. And um, I have seen that so much in my recovery because I'm able to like basically like I, I don't have very good hearing in general. Like I'm, I'm sometimes I'm concerned about it because I'm only 26, but I can hear you know, two, two people that, two people talking about their bodies from like a mile away now, because my brain is wired that way. And it's always to set like women or femmes. It's never two guys or men. So I really believe that if we could change the narrative, we could do so many more important things in our lives and really honestly take up more space in this world, which is basically the whole point of diet culture is to stop us from taking up more space. So I think that by changing those conversations and talking about, hey, like, what did you do on the weekend? How are you feeling? Um, you know, what, what's, your, what's your favorite recipe right now? What food gets you excited? Like, what's your, you know, what's your favorite chocolate bar? Instead of, you know, normalizing normal foods and normalizing just 
everyday conversations instead of, instead of exchanging diet tips can lead to really important conversations that we are not having right now. How is that language or is it different in the like I'm thinking of heteronormative culture but amongst the LGBTQ sort of community do you feel that's as prominent like the sort of superficial language? Well what I did not know uh, when I before my recovery is that eating disorders are actually much more prevalent in the LGBTQ community than in, um, yeah, in that in heterosexual people um, or cisgendered people. Um, and it makes a lot of sense um, if you think about it, especially with trans people, because um, they sometimes some a trans person might not necessarily feel like their body is representing, well, like that's the whole concept, that their body is not representing their gender, their true gender. Um, so uh, eating disorders are a tool of, you know, um, being in the body that they really belong in. And, you know, when I, when I started posting a lot about going to my eating disorder support group, uh, a lot of people reached out to me and saying like, oh, I'd like to go. And it, everybody that I've brought with me has been LGBT. Plus, and that is not necessarily because you know I don't have that many queer friends. I really don't. It's very concentrated in our community, so that language is not necessarily. It's hard to say. I I don't think that it is less present. I don't think that it is because even in the most like open-minded spaces, diet culture is still there. Fat phobia is still there. You know, you can be the most politically correct person in the world but I, I I hear people who are very very cool and like enlightening about feminism and racism and transphobia but they're still fat phobic in the way that they talk about bodies so um, I think that it's like one of those one of the last big social you know justice issues that we really need to tackle in in all spaces but I feel especially in LGBTQ plus Spaces. Wow, I that's enlightening. I wouldn't have guessed. I would have thought it's maybe more inclusive, and it's like there's less labels or mm. i ideas of who you should be. But I I guess that just shows the pervasiveness of of a uh, eating disorder and the culture. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. It's everywhere. There's nowhere that it isn't right now. But I think that, you know, just by, just by, you know, using what we know now about, you know, diet culture and how it can be very, very harmful and changing that conversation one person at a time can really change our spaces and make them safer because it, it, it is really like, it's a mental health issue to create self spaces, that, sorry, safe spaces. It's very, very important to, you know, it, it prevents so many severe things from happening. Just to use the right language for someone. Example for trans people to use the right gender pronoun can, is literally suicide prevention. And just like, you know, for someone who's really, really deep in an eating disorder, not allowing diet culture, fat phobia to be present in that space can make the difference between healing and not healing. So yeah, it's, uh, it can be surprising how it can infiltrate itself and, you know, sneak into really, really open-minded spaces. But diet culture is a powerful, powerful thing, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm looking at, I was taking notes on some things you said, and earlier you had said that your body was your social capital mm. and that just that just stood out to me so much i i hadn't really thought about the importance of our bodies in this system that we live in yeah wow mm. just okay so what are <laughs> <laughs> like wow it's just a lot to think about um i know <laughs> what are some things that now motivate you and how do you define success for yourself now? So what motivates me right now is seeing how different my life is going to be now that I'm on this healing and recovery path. Um, I've always wanted to be a mom and I still very, very much want to be a mom. And I can see how 
much more fun I'm going to have um, now that I am able to have a clear, a, a more, more of a clear mind and um, much, much more joy in my life. So I'm always motivated when I think, you know what, the cycle ends here. This was passed on from probably my great grandmother to my grandmother to my mom and to me I'm stopping it here and it motivates me so so much to keep going um I I think about it all the time how I want to do things um in the in a safe and happy way when I have kids and it what, what also motivates me is like I said a few times during this conversation is all of the time that I now get to use that I didn't get to before I'm never going to get that time again you know those hours and hours of meal planning and prepping and obsessing and working out that I I really invested at that point I'm never going to get them back but I can now be so happy that you know at 25 26 years old I was able to say okay no I'm taking my life into my hands again I want to do different things with my time for my well-being and for my happiness so I'm very motivated by that and I'm also really really um, motivated by what I see on social media right now so there is really an amazing anti-diet you know uh, body image body positive uh, presence on social media right now Sometimes we think of social media as, you know, this really bad thing that, you know, spreads so many uh, bad messages. And that's true, it does. But the cool thing about it is that you're able to curate it for what you need to see at that moment. So that's what I did. I really curated my Instagram, specifically Instagram, to only show me things that are going to promote a a positive mindset for me, whether it's about, you know, um, mental health or recovering of eating disorders or just positive body image. So when I see what people are doing, it really motivates me to spread the message also. So in the last little while, actually just in October, I launched a blog. So I've been able to write more long form about, you know, my experience and some tips on, you know, living your life uh, free of diet culture. I definitely am enjoying it so much. I'm just kind of doing it more as a hobby right now, but um, I'd eventually maybe like to do it more as, you know, something that I do as a career um I would love to go back to school and there's so many things now that I can actually see myself doing because of all of the time that I have it's opened so many doors so I I have a lot on my list but I'm really excited about how life is just way more open to opportunities and experiences it's really opened up so much for me recently so it's it's awesome so okay I love all that where (laughs) um let's see I think we're gonna get into some closing questions now at this point okay cool what are three things that make you feel like your best self and these can be products or routines that you have anything Ooh. okay um three things that make me feel like my best self Ooh. this is tough I think that one of the things that makes me feel like my best self is setting boundaries. (laughs) I know this sounds like very (laughs) harsh, but setting boundaries has been extremely liberating for myself, whether it's, um, you know, letting people know, hey, I'm going through eating disorder recovery now. I need to refrain from these topics. It has made me be able to shine more and be myself more without feeling triggered so setting boundaries definitely is so helpful in me in in helping me be happy right now the second thing is definitely enjoying food I can't even tell you how much allowing all foods in my life has been liberating and taking away the stigma on certain foods for myself so just giving myself permission to give food a big place in my life because I really have always been a foodie and just kind of like in hiding but now I am no longer in hiding and it is amazing and the third thing that really helps me to feel like myself is a little bit more superficial but I really love it it's uh, I love taking some time before bed 
and doing a long skincare routine. So I just love how much it grounds me and it's really just me. I close the bathroom door. I put a little YouTube video on that I want to see and I just lather myself in some creams and serums. And I really, really love how it allows me to just kind of like take off the stress of the day and just feel good about myself and feel feel all shiny and and full of oils but it really plays a big role more than just the superficial side of things it really helps me breathe and calm down so definitely those would be my three things they sound great setting boundaries is very important I think um, you've kind of touched on different ways that can be effective and of course enjoying food and I'm a fan of a long skincare routine myself so those all sound really great awesome what is your, do you happen to know your sun sign? Yes, I do. Scorpio. Oh, okay. Do you know your yes. rising and moon sign by chance? Well, okay. I'm not very well versed, but I am a Taurus. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my rising is Scorpio. And I don't really know my moon sign. I'd have to look it up. I, I looked it up at some point and I didn't take note. But um, all of these hilarious memes on Instagram like about astrology have really made me want to get into it um (laughs) (laughs) but I yeah I actually know nothing about what like my rising sign means I know that I feel very much like a Taurus based on everything that I see um but yeah yeah I don't know anything about it it might pique your interest I don't know if they've been more prominent or or if it's just showing up in my feed for some reason a little bit more, but I feel like I've been seeing them a lot, um, like the astrology stuff a lot more too. Yes, it's everywhere. And it's so funny. I love it. I really, I'm, it makes me want to know everything about it. <laughs> it's fun stuff. Mm-hmm. What is the best piece of advice that anyone has ever given you? Oh, okay. A lot. I've had so much good advice. But I think that the best piece of advice I receive every single time I go see my therapist and she says, it's going to be hard to translate because I have a therapy in French, but she says, she always asks me when I describe a thing that I feel with, you know, someone else, an interaction or a relationship or something like that. And she asks me, does that emotion belong to you? And usually, It doesn't. Usually the way that that person is making me feel is because of something that they're doing or because of a trauma that that they have not processed yet or because of, you know, anything that they're dealing with because I definitely am an empath and I definitely take on other people's problems and energy and separating, you know, taking a deep breath and asking, okay, is this really something that I need to feel right now? Or is that something that they brought that I took from someone else? So it's been so helpful to separate. Does that belong to me? Or does that belong to them? And do I need it? No, I'm gonna let it go. So it's been really helpful. What is a food right now that is exciting to you? Oh, my gosh. I could talk all day about that. Um, I'm really into, I recently was gifted a pressure cooker. I never had a pressure cooker before. It's actually a pressure cooker that pressure cooks, air fries, just does like everything under the sun, which is like super exciting. And um, so I'm really, uh, the air fryer component has made me like just appreciate potatoes way more than I ever did. So I just love everything potatoes fries, mashed potatoes, just all potatoes. I just love, I love carbs in general, but potatoes are underrated and I definitely have rediscovered them recently. So yeah, potatoes for sure. That sounds amazing. (laughs) (laughs) If you could have dinner with one person, living or dead, who would it be? Oh my gosh. Um, That's an excellent question. Honestly, probably Céline Dion. I love her for no particular reason. She's just amazing. She makes me laugh. She's so talented. She's just a good time. I would love to spend an hour with her. Anyways, I just, I'm, I have this obsession with Celine Dion. I really do. I'm I'm obsessed with her just on a, I'm just a fangirl. I really am. I'm a French Canadian also, you know, she has a special place in my heart, 
but um yeah that definitely sitting down just like for fun you know but for more of like a I want to know what you think on certain things issue I really am completely obsessed with Christy Harrison she is anti-diet dietitian she has this podcast called Food Spike and it's amazing I've learned so much from her and I would really really love to if if ever I had the chance to sit in front of her and have a meal with her it would be really really cool I was also going to ask what is a book a podcast a movie or any sort of resource that has inspired you and that you would recommend to listeners so Food Psych would be one of them 100% Food Psych has got me through some rough times especially if you don't have access to therapy right now it is not a replacement for therapy but it can be really helpful because there's so much important information on Food Psych Um, another one uh, a book that has completely changed the way that I see bodies is The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, she starts the book by, um, you know, writing this homage to her mother's belly. Um, her mother had this big belly and it's basically like she's, her and her siblings are like running and hugging her mom's belly. And it just romanticizes that part of the body that we all have issues with. And it has brought me to tears every time I read it. Beautiful, beautiful book. And it's also a great audiobook. She, uh, Sonia Renee Taylor is a great narrator. So I would highly recommend reading that one. It's awesome. Okay. Everyone will need to check those out for sure. <laughs> Are there any sort of last minute tips or takeaway that you would like to tell listeners just to in- maybe help someone else out who might be struggling or not sure if they have some disordered eating patterns that need attention, like what sort of advice would you give them? Well, I guess that I would say, you know, if you feel, you feel restricted in your life, look at your food rules, look at the restrictions that you are imposing on yourself and that it's not your fault that you're imposing on yourself because the culture told you to don't be afraid to look into it. I know it can be scary because honestly, the second you look into it is the moment where you will probably not be able to turn back and it might completely rock your boat and completely change your life. But trust me, your life will only get better by letting go of those restrictions. There are food restrictions that some people absolutely need, like, you know, people who are celiac or things like that. But If you feel in any way like you are stuck in a box and your life feels really small right now and you feel like you have zero time and you're constantly crunched and you feel limited, there's a chance that, you know, the way that you are restricting your eating and the way that you're trying to manipulate your body might have something to do with that. And letting go of that control is completely liberating. It is extremely scary also. But when you get to a point where you realize all of the amazing things that you're gaining by letting go of that control you'll see exactly what I mean and you'll see what life can really bring you and how precious life is I guess my last words are you know it can be scary but it is very very worth it to put your recovery and your health and your relationship with food and body as a priority Lastly, uh, let everyone know where they can find you. For sure. So I'm uh, quite active on Instagram. My Instagram is She's in Sync. And I also, like I said, just started a blog at She's in And uh, I've been having a lot of fun with that. I don't quite know a lot about the blogging world and I'm not very good with technology, but I've been having a lot of fun. So uh, I'm also available via email at She's in Sync at gmail.com. Oh, thank you. That's so great. Making yourself available that way for everyone. Let me just say, I like your blog a lot. I know you're just getting started with it, but it feels, I feel a lot of you coming through and it's empowering. I like, I like the empowerment behind all of your content so far. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It's been very very helpful for me just you know being like an extrovert letting the world into what I'm dealing with is uh, very healing for me but it's also been so so nice to connect with people and just to to you know feel like there is a lot of this 
you know, body positive movement going on. It just feels really good to be part of it. It feels very validating. Wonderful. Okay. All right, then. That brings us to the end. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. So I feel like I learned so much. And uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm so excited to keep following along with you and all of your journey. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation, too. And I'm happy that we were able to, to chat. It was really awesome. Thank you. What did you think of the episode? Melanie has been one of my favorite people to talk to. Coming from the wellness space, everyone is all about rules and rigidity. Heck, I'm still trying to ease myself off of that. So witnessing how she has let go of a lot and found peace that way is just a beautiful thing and very inspiring. I think this mentality can be applied to many different situations. If you're a little bit type A about things, then it doesn't need to just pertain to food. I think it shows up in different ways in our life, and it's something we need to be actively on top of. Taking note of where we are investing a lot of our time and energy, and if that thing that we're paying so much attention to is actually helping us. Also, perhaps, what could we be doing with this time and energy if we weren't so narrowed in on this one area? The world really does open up in incredible ways, like she said in the episode, when you let go of control. Easier said than done, but hey, we're all on a journey of our own design, and the pace that we're going at is exactly the pace that is what's right for us right now at this point in our life. If you know someone who you think might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. Copy the link and text it to them or post it on your Instagram stories or Facebook page. I love hearing what you guys think about the episodes, so keep that coming too. I really like your feedback. And, you know, that's all I've got for you guys today. Until next week, we'll see each other then. Have a good one. Bye!